you so much for joining us here today. We are joined by a really interesting speaker, the founder of Social Chain, also the new dragon on Dragon's Den, and the author for Sexy, Happy Sexy Millionaire. Well, put your hands together for Stephen Bartlett, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. No problem. How has your journey been so far today? Yeah, long. Um, been doing a lot of traveling up and down the country for, uh, for, for Dragons filming, which has just started. So I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to say about that. But um, yeah, just started filming for, for the new series, which would be my first series with the show. So yeah, up and down the country. And obviously I record my podcast and live in London now. So going to spend the next sort of few months in transit, but it's okay. It's, it's, a, it's an honour to be here as well. So Amazing. We're really looking forward to having you. So we'll spend sort of the heart, first half an hour just unpacking a little bit of your journey, all the stuff that you've done to date, and then we'll open up to audience questions and get them to sort sure. of participate as well. Um, so your new book, Happy Sexy Millionaire, mm. self-proclaimed, did you author that? No. Yourself? So do you know what? There's a, there's a couple of reasons for the title. The first one is... Um, so which, I don't know which one to, to say first. I'd say, so the, the title came from what I wrote in my diary at 18 years old when I was at university. Bear in mind, I was only at university for the one lecture. But in the front page of my diary, I wrote that I wanted to be, I wanted a Range Rover Sport to be my first car. I wanted to have a million pounds before I was 25. I wanted to date uh, a girl for a long period of time. I wanted a long-term relationship, I think it says, verbatim. And I want to work on my body image because I was very skinny. I was 18, I had... Um, I'd actually just dropped out of university at that point, and I was living in the worst part of Manchester. Didn't have a driving license, didn't have any money. Parents weren't talking to me, and um, because I dropped out of university, they told me they wouldn't speak to me until I went back. And um, yeah, that's what I aspired for, and th that's really where the book begins. And it's the journey of trying to achieve those things, but really the um, reflection upon achieving all of those things, all of them. My first car was a Range Rover Sport. I made millions before I was 25, etc. Um, the reflection of what I probably should have written instead. And, um, and then the second reason why I chose that title is typically with books, I think people are virtue signaling to some degree. So, you know, there's a book called, am I allowed to swear here? Is that yeah. a thing? <laughs> yep, you are. Um, there's a book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, right? And, yep. you know, it sells really well, but I, I think predominantly because of the title. And so people are virtue signaling to their friends that they are going to become the type of person that no longer gives a fuck. And so um, understanding the Instagram generation, the title Happy Sexy Millionaire is somewhat of a, a positive virtue signal about who you want to become and who you're striving to become to a generation that probably have their values in the wrong order. So it's a bit of a mousetrap in that regard um, to, to entice people who um, are probably fundamentally searching for the wrong thing. We'll definitely kind of unpick that generation sure. as we go on. So take us back then to the decision of dropping out of university. Um, you know, that's obviously, there's a lot of people, we're at Cambridge, probably goes through people's minds at least yeah. once a week here. Yeah. Talk us through making that big decision. Well, I, I think maybe my ability to reason from first principles and come up with solutions to the problems I encounter in my life um, that are new and that are based on the things that are true right now as opposed to accepting convention and whatever convention says is probably the reason that if I, if I have been successful and why I've been successful because it runs as a consistent theme through the way that I built my business, the way that I led my life, the way that I quit, quit things very quickly. And what I mean by that is in all of our lives we have um, hundreds of moments where we encounter challenges, maybe millions of moments where we, we encounter challenges. And typically what you have a choice, the choice is accept the conventional blueprint, which might say, um, which you know, society delivers to you. It says when you encounter this challenge, when you fall in love with someone, you do marriage. When you, you know, set off 18 years old into the, into the world, you do university. You do it for four years, then this is how you get a job. Life sets out this very you know, safe, apparently safe path for you to follow. Um, and that will, you know, the returns of, uh, you know, but, but, I, but as I reflect on that, that path was written in another time by somebody else that lived in a different world that wasn't you, that didn't have your interests, that didn't live in 2021, in June 2021. No one ever has. So 
it makes a lot of sense if you want to find better solutions to go to the extra uh, effort to try and find a new solution for you for the time you're living in. And that's pretty much the story of my life. And so went off to university at 18 years old to study business, of all things, and got there. I looked around, and um, I knew this was a t uh, wasn't a good university. I went to Manchester Metropolitan University, and it wasn't going to take me far. But upon getting there, looking around and seeing that everyone else was kind of sleeping on the desk and hungover and drunk and stuff like that, it, it really dawned on me that I was going to go to the same place as all of, the, all of them, and I was ultimately going get, to get the same p piece of paper as all of them. And to me, that didn't feel, like, logically as as something that would help me. And then the more I reflected, I thought, that's actually going to hold me back. If I walk into the working world and say, I've got this Manchester Metropolitan University degree, how is that going to help me when she's asleep and pissed and she does not want to be here? So I decided that wasn't the herd that I wanted to move with. And, um, and also, there's so many like fundamental reflections. One of them is, if I am going to be an entrepreneur, who am I going to show this piece of paper to anyway? And obviously, experience, learnt experience, versus the hypothetical poster that the guy at the front of this lecture hall is telling me to create with these crayons, felt it pens, is gonna be much more valuable. And so for me, it was easy. And these quitting decisions, which are integral, I think, to finding success, have always been so easy for me. I've always found it very easy to quit because this mental framework I have arrives at the end of this like yes, no, yes, no flow chart. And I trust it. And so I quit university and off I went. And ultimately I started a business that followed the same pattern at a time when people were using posters and flyers and all sorts of outdated nonsense to market. I, was try I realized that social media was clearly more interesting. The numbers were way bigger, but nobody else, um, nobody else felt that way. So my business grew because, again, I reasoned from the pr first principles that I had, and I was like, clearly that's the right answer. But convention says, no, 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 no. Social media is an awful place to be. It's dangerous for brands. All the narratives I heard back then. Um, uh, it's unsafe, all of these things. But clearly the numbers were bigger. And I don't need convention, I just need my own evidence. And my own evidence said that building a social media business back in 2012 would be a really good idea. So yeah, that's a, that's a really fundamental principle in my life, but it's, it's very difficult. Elon Musk talks a lot about it. He says the reason he was able to create um, f fast, electric, affordable cars was because of he reasoned from first principles. Everybody said to him, batteries are too expensive. He said, well, if you take the battery apart and you buy the, cons the individual metals that are within the battery, on the metal exchange, you can make really cheap batteries. Again, that required you to not accept convention, not accept the way that the world has always built batteries, and to build your own. And that's where I think true innovation comes from. Um, but it's very difficult. It's very, because there's no, with the conventional answer, you have, it's tried and tested. With, when you build your own answers and you write your own script, it can go either way. There is a chance of failure which the conventional answer doesn't possess. And there's also a chance of wild success. But um, I think you have no choice, especially as it relates to the choices at the course of your life, because no one's ever lived your life in this time. So that's one script you definitely do have to write. So you're setting up your first venture, Wall Park, and yeah. then did you meet Dom before you started Social Chain? Talk us about that sort of yeah, relationship. Yeah, so uh, my business partner, Dom, who was my business partner in Social Chain, was a kid at university, and I went up to... York, I met him in a Revolutions pub. So basically what had happened is I was starting a online digital notice board for students because you know universities still have like physical notice boards. You might have one knocking around here. Um, we, we do. You do, <laughs> right? Like with pieces of paper attached to it? With pieces yeah, of paper. Yeah, nuts. Um, so I saw that and thought, well, you know, someone should bring this online. Someone should bring these physical notice boards online. It would be a, it'd be a good idea. And so that's what I wanted to do with Woolpark. Um, and I needed to figure out how to get potentially millions of students to come to my website every day. I, I went on Twitter and I saw that there was like a meme parody student page that had been created, emailed the page, um, went and met the founder, Dom. He had 5,000 followers following it. And a lot back then. Uh, it was a lot back then. Persuaded him to drop out of university in a pub, told him to come with me. We were going to build a big business together. And he was very persuadable. And he dropped out of university. Again, his parents weren't happy. I remember his nan calling me and she said, when I find that Stephen Bartlett, I'm gonna give him what for? And I don't know what that means. I think it's like a Yorkshire thing, but I know it's not a good thing. <laughs> but she's friend, we're good now, because he he's done very well. And so, yeah, he dropped out of university, and that's very what I did. Very well or very, very well? He's very well, well. he's a multi-millionaire, he can't complain. 
I'm sure his nan's doing just fine. Um, but no, that's what I did. So at, tw at 20 years old, 19, 20 years old, I just went around the country and the world and met every young person I could that had built a big social media page because I wanted to use their channels to drive traffic to my website. Again, this is like revolutionary back then. Mm -hmm. It's not so revolutionary now. And um, eventually I had millions and millions and millions of followers across all of these Facebook and Twitter and Instagram pages in 2013. And I was getting millions of views to my website. And at some point I realized that the social media pages I had were a more compelling proposition than my website. Again, this is another thing about entrepreneurship is, is you can be really romantic about your initial hypothesis and you can take your initial hypothesis to the grave. So if I, had, if I had just been really rigid about my initial hypothesis, which was Warpark, I probably would have still been working at it and failing at it now. But I had new evidence that A, my website wasn't really working, but B, the social media pages I built possessed tremendous power. And this kind of, and so I changed direction. I, 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 Pivoted. I, I quit. I, I quit. Um, had a big glass of wine one night, emailed my investors and my, my company and said, I, I'm quitting. I believe in the social media thing more. They didn't. They told me it was a waste of time. So upon quitting, I was able to take all of the social media pages with me because they didn't value them. And then we, we built them up and we had hundreds of millions of followers. We were doing 7 billion video views at our peak um, in, September, in November 2017, which made us one of the top 10 biggest media companies in the world, just with our social media channels. And it, yeah, I mean, and then it turns out we were on a incoming wave, which was social media, and we rode it into shore. So you telling your investors that you're quitting and you're leaving, did that spare you on to make sure that Social Chain was a success or you just were like, I'm going in that direction regardless what they think? And I'm I don't care what they think. I didn't, I, it's not, I didn't quit, you know. And, and generally, as a, as a principle for my life, I care much more about satisfying people who support me than um, proving wrong uh, people that don't. Like, they don't care about me. Why would I care about them? I, I, I've always found it really distasteful, this idea of, like, proving people wrong. It's like, why would you care about those people? You know, so, no, I didn't, it didn't, that didn't concern me. What concerned me was, like, not wasting my life dragging a dead donkey up a hill, and that's what I was doing with my startup. It wasn't going to work. So you were then on track to become uh, one of UK's fastest businesses that were growing, mm. you were acquiring. Who was your first company and that you've in terms, onboarded. in terms of clients um every, uh, it was really crazy uh, one of our first clients was spotify and then fox movies like we'd, we started doing all the marketing for all of their movies using our social media channels and then everybody by the end by the time i resigned several years later like six years later we were doing the marketing for uber across the us coca-cola across europe amazon um across europe across the world i, I believe um boohoo you know Pretty little thing. dot com, nasty girl. We did all their their mark, a lot of their social media marketing for many, many years, five, six years. Um, Logitech, you name it. Um, I feel like we've, I feel like we were responsible for um, the social media marketing for most of the UK's leading brands, and then internationally when our offices expanded. And obviously, you had a very young team. Like, what was it like managing people either the same age as you or a lot younger? How did you ensure that you were kind of keeping them engaged? And things yeah, like so I, I, think, um, I think when you're an entrepreneur and you're starting, um, you have some, like, inbuilt insecurities which you have to overcome. So one of the critical mistakes I made is my first hires were also, like, really inexperienced and young. And I, I reflect on why I did that, but I, part of me thinks I didn't think I had the right to hire really good people, really experienced people, because I was, like, 19 or 20. And that is, like, a, that's probably one of my, my single biggest critical mistake was, you know, by definition, a company, like Google definition, a company is a group of people. And that is what you're playing with. It's like lining your starting 11 up against another starting 11. So, um... I, I, yeah, I just, uh, I think that's just the most important thing. But young founders, they make that mistake. They hire their best mate or some guy who's up for it, you know, and they don't think they have the right to go for world-class talent. And that is probably the, the single biggest determinant factor as, as to what, whether you'll succeed or fail. So in my new companies, I do the exact opposite. I start by trying to get, like, in my new company that I'm starting at the moment, I'm trying to get the best people in the world to come and work on this with me um, because that was such a big mistake. So how does that kind of job um, application look 
compared to so what you, when you're trying to hire the best talent it's it's you know this is like again so this is maybe I, I said one of the underlying reasons for my success was this first principle thinking this like desire to find a new solution to a challenge that I encounter um, the second factor would be sales right the second factor as to why I've had success in my life is probably because I'm quite good at selling things. So, um, and that's what you, that's what the job of a CEO is really. It's selling a vision and a mission to investors, to people you want to hire, to clients, whatever. Um, and that's again, so my answer is it's just sales. You have to call them, meet them in that bar, you know, where I met Dom all those years ago and present a really compelling mission that they believe in. One that's more compelling than whatever they're doing now. And, um, and yeah, that's it. That's the answer. And I love the fact that one of your um, job applications, someone flew an owl into the office. Is that what you were getting with, with your line of questioning? You no, 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 <laughs> no. But I yeah, like yeah, the fact that true. how you yeah, acquire yeah. other people, but yeah. how people get your attention as yeah. well. Has there been anything yeah. else that's been quite Yeah, unusual? so I mean, like a CV doesn't tell me much, right? Um, so we very early on in social change, and this is, again comes back to this idea of like thinking about new solutions to problems. CVs really are like... Um, they're not, they're not the best way to understand if a person is capable of doing the job. So we very early on stopped accepting CVs and we wanted you as a creative business to find a creative way to, to apply. And that obviously led to a wide range of madness. Um, and as you say, so one, one day I was at my desk, my PA comes up to me and says, put this glove on. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, put the glove on. So, and she gave me that look, which meant put the glove on. I put the glove on. Um, and moments later, an owl flies in, swoops around the warehouse, which is our office in Manchester, lands on the glove on my arm and drops this USB stick onto my desk. And I put the USB stick in and it had a CV on it. And uh, people always ask, say, well, how did it go? Like, so obviously the guy <laughs> was, <laughs> well, we, I brought the guy up from Plymouth who had applied, Sur surprise, he was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I didn't get the job. Likely. But yeah, probably yeah, probably should have guessed from the application. But no, he came for the application. He came for the job interview, but just yeah. nuts. And sort of moving on to your podcast. So yeah. Dari of a CEO, I'm absolutely an avid fan. You've had such an amazing array of guests. Mm. Um, what you know, where did you? Why did you decide to create that kind of very early on into podcasting? Mm. Right. So I think there's a couple of couple of reasons. One of them is that with when I look at social media and the channels that I had at the time when I started. Um, the diary of a CEO, I was making Facebook videos and those Facebook videos were getting anywhere between like 3 million and 33 million views each, but they were like three minutes and they were just viral takes on something, relationships, success, whatever. So 30, you know, 33 million views per okay. video, right? Staggering numbers. But there's, there, there wasn't a tremendous amount of depth in that. And if you look at, you know, other social channels, Instagram, Snapchat, wherever, there's not a lot of depth. So people don't, you know, like, if I ask this room of people now, do you remember the last thing you w saw on Instagram? Nobody would. But if I said to you, do you remember the last thing you watched on Netflix? A lot of people would, because, and that's because of that content has greater depth. And so I wanted something that had greater depth. I used to have my daily vlog where I'd film myself every single day for about, about two years or so. And that provided depth, but I didn't necessarily want to do that anymore. And so what a podcast does is it gives you real depth. So the listenership is way lower than those videos I was making on Facebook. However, it's way more important to the people that listen. And it allows me to, um, it's the one channel where you can speak unfiltered with full context without 280 characters. And I also know that podcasting is growing because I know there's loads of macro factors like Spotify acquiring all the podcast, um, podcast companies and then listing podcasts on their app. And I know that smart cars are going to enable more sort of digital streaming. Internet's getting better. We can stream more on the go. People are getting busier. More people are in transit at the time. Um, and so all of these macro factors were, were accelerating the growth of podcasts, but also podcasting is a self-fulfilling prophecy because the more good podcasts there are, the more people there's listening to podcasts. So it's like a snowball falling down a hill. And then lastly, I, the reason for the diary of a CEO, a number of things. So the title itself presents a little bit of a, like a juxtaposition. A CEO is something that's like, has a lot of information, but is typically secretive. And then a diary is something that is open and um, contains a lot of secrets. So the diary of a CEO um, was meant is a fairly compelling idea. And um, and lastly, I wanted to debunk a lot of the 
misconceptions about what it takes to be and what it is to be successful because there's a lot of nonsense on Instagram about what it takes to be successful and what success is all about and how hard you have to work. So the podcast was originally founded to just debunk all that nonsense. Yeah. Do you have any favorite guests that you've had on? Do you know, my favorite guests are always very unexpected. Um, I had Russell Kane on recently and he, do you know what he said to me? And I'm sure he won't mind me saying this, but he said he got more messages following that than he did on Live at the Apollo when he did that, than, wow. um, the Jonathan Ross show more messages to him following that and I get it the guy is like you, you think of him as a comedian super super smart and then my other favorite guests are ones where they're just completely willing to be honest Ben Fogel came on I think like two weeks ago and within two minutes of the podcast he's telling me you know about his how his self-confidence was just de like, you know devastated as a kid all the reasons why and it goes deep and and Middleton's the same talks about everything from the day he wanted to kill himself and really vivid details about his diary and the journey he's been on. And it's not an interview. It's, and I will push and push and push and push if I have to. If I don't feel like they answer the question, I will keep pushing and, I, and, you know, and really get to the truth of it. So do you script them? And do they know? No, no? just a no scripting, no questions, no scripting, no questions, no questions. No scripting. By that. We have, so we do, I do my research, right? Mm. And then what typically happens is if you looked at what I was, what I have written down in front of me, I usually will have like four words, which are like just key prompts that I want to make sure I don't miss. So I had Liam Payne on from One Direction last week and uh, he goes very, very deep again, being in, you know, 14 year old kid who goes for an X Factor audition does really well on the show, then gets kicked off, spends two years as basically a failure. People shouting at him in McDonald's, oh, you're that one, you're that X Factor reject. Goes back onto X Factor, gets put into this boy band called One Direction, and they become the biggest thing in the world since like the Beatles. And like, can you imagine what it's like to be 18 years old and to have thousands of people always sit outside your hotel room? You can't leave, you're trapped and to go to a stage and there's 110,000 people in a stadium screaming your name and then you have to go off the back door of the stage back to your hotel room and sit there and then you have to go back up to a stage and then back to your hotel room you can't leave your hotel room and doing that for a decade it's like Crazy. you know and he 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 talks about you know th that that same suicidal ideation and by the end of it i think you know because before the conversation i think oh my god he lived the dream life for a young guy mm. like rock that's star. what it looks like right oh yeah. my god and by the end of it, I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I'm not you. I just want to give him a cuddle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And sort of, I could ask you, I could keep talking to you about the podcast all day, but I kind of want to move on to your new thing. So That's Dragon's thing. Den. Oh, Dragon's Den. Okay. <laughs> what new thing? Yeah. Um, so tell us about, so you've said when you were 23, you said that you wanted to become the next dragon. And obviously that happened. A lot of manifesting, do you think? How did you know you were going to get that gig? Me um, so I, I, I applied for Dragon's Den 10 years ago, 10 years ago, almost to the week as to when it was announced that I was a dragon and someone that follows me on YouTube found that my application. Um, I'd been saying for years that I was going to be on Dragon's Den, many, many years, just continually. Um, do I, I don't necessarily believe in manifestation because it kind of, it kind of, I don't know, mitigates responsibility and I don't think that's a useful thing to be doing in your life. I think of visualization or whatever as like the sat nav you put on but if you just do the sat nav on your journey here today you'd still be sat in your driveway you also have to put the key in and drive mm. and so it's important to know where you're going but you also have to drive um and uh, outside of that i think manifestation is just a cute I idea that people have created um especially in hindsight to and to to you know connect the dots and to say that's why i'm here today but so how's Dragon's Den going? You're filming at the moment. Yes, um, we have fil just started filming, film my first couple of days. Um, I'm probably not allowed to say anything about what's, what happens, but it's, it's, ex it's a very honest show, that's what I'll say. So there's not, you know, scripts and we don't know what's walking through the doors. And, and what have you got your eyes on? What, do you know what you're looking for? Or are you just really yeah, open-minded? Like, yeah, I mean, life has taught me that the single most important thing in business is the entrepreneur. And you can have a really terrible idea, a business, like a, you could have a really uninspiring business idea, mm. but if it's presented by remarkable entrepreneurs, it's a great thing to invest in. And conversely, you can have the world's best idea, and I've seen the world's best idea 
with a really bad entrepreneur and mm -hmm. i promise you you will lose your money and i, I you know it, it makes me reflect when i was 18 years old and i got my first investor i met him in a hotel in london and um he said to me something i've never forgotten and he said he so he'd given me his he had invested in me 18 years old and he said do you know what he goes i don't really know what wallpark is or what you do but he goes but i just know you're going to do something good I and I thought that. to myself, you've, you've given your money and you don't know what, what you've How given it to. How much did he give you? That wasn't a lot of money. But to me, it was, was a, it? It, like 10 grand. But to it's me, grand. it was <laughs> the most money. I was like shoplifting Chicago Town pizzas. So <laughs> it was like, I was rich. Like it was like a, like a lottery win for me then. So um, when you're a student and you're just like scraping past, like, you know, nicking spaghetti out of your like, roommate's cupboard and that, 10 grand. It's <laughs> a staggering a amount of money. of money, you know. Uh, it wasn't enough money, though, it turns out, because, yeah, it takes a lot more to build tech companies. <laughs> but we raised more money after that. And what kind of personality do you want to become now that you're sort of, like, transferring onto TV? So are you going to stay really true to yourself? Are you... I just don't think I have any choice, right? So, like, I think I am who I am. And if nobody likes that, then que sera, sera. Like, I've, I've got a podcast, which I filmed almost 100 episodes of. I film myself every single day for my daily vlog for two years. At this point, we can't be acting. Do you know what I mean? So on TV, my central objective is, in fact... And I said this a million times to like people that have asked me this question. My central objective is to not be taken by the convention of the show or the brightness of the spotlight, and, and let that just distract me from being myself. My mm. central objective is just to be myself, and like that is what it is, you know. And um, it's it's multifaceted. It's honest. It's I guess empathetic. Um, but it is what it is. It's humorous. I crack a lot of, you know, me and Peter have a lot of banter. <laughs> Who are you I'm always next trying to, to finish it. Um, well, I've taken Tej Lavani's oh, seat, okay. so that should... Yeah, I know take, where you yeah. are. Okay, and I want to talk to you about female entrepreneurship. As a female mm -hmm. entrepreneur myself, we have obviously a lot of lack of funding. Yeah. Um, I think the statistic at the moment is for every pound, uh, female-only female, on female led businesses get three pence in mm -hmm. a pound. And if we start talking about race, we'll... Literally, the, the stats don't look good. Mm. Um, as a person of colour yourself, mm. kind of what are you going to do and mm. what, is, what is going on in the kind of investor space um, and how do we ensure that sort of females continue, like we change investors' mindsets? It's a really, really good question. Um, what I do in the den is I invest in entrepreneurs based on the merit of the idea. And um, I, whether, you know, and it, because, you know, when we think about what prejudice is and the nature of prejudice, a lot of it comes from our own unconscious biases about certain ethnic groups or genders or whatever else. Um, there's not a ton I can do in the den to try and um, overcome my own uh, unconscious biases because I get to see the entrepreneur. And I get to hear them speak and, you know, and I'm with them for, you know, a long period of time. You see on the show a couple of minutes, it's not. Um, so I, I, I believe that I'm invest, investing based on merit. In other parts of my life, like the companies that I build, it's much easier to be, um, to put processes in place to make sure that we are, um, we're not allowing our unconscious biases to impact pay, hiring, promotions, and those kinds of things. And we've done that at, at my previous company very well, I think. In fact, the company in the UK is led by a, a female entrepreneur. My, my, the company that I founded, Katie Leeson, um, and, and one of our co-founders is also um, female. Um, and what, one of the things we did there is we have a team that audit our company to make sure that from an um, equal pay perspective and from a hiring perspective, we're doing everything we can to um, avoid any um, un unconscious biases impacting things like promotions pay and people so um yeah that, that's that's my stance on it i don't do a ton of investments outside of the den in c private companies so i'm investing in outside of the den i'm investing in public companies um for people who's watching on the live stream Stephen was actually just stopped before we headed into the chamber and <laughs> asked to invest in so yeah i just thought he's you're now just forever going to be stopped wherever you go <laughs> yeah so i've been told in fact the um my fellow dragons told me about this they told me that um they get a lot of inquiries from a lot of people you know out in public um to look at their businesses i'm not against it 
um, but obviously, you, for, just thinking logically, there has to be a process. Yeah. So, yeah. Perfect. Okay. And sort of, I just wanted to ask you some like kind of quick fire questions. Do you think now having, you know, the COVID and everything is now a good time to start a business? Yeah. Amazing time to start a business, especially a certain type of business, right? Yeah. One that, um, one that appreciates that the world has changed maybe slightly permanently in certain ways, or at least has been, th the process of change has been exacerbated by the pandemic and things have become more digital. Um, I don't think, I think people have overestimated the permanence of remote working, but I, but I do think that a digital adoption has been accelerated. So that gives you some ideas, but also people are more concerned about their health than ever before. And that's something that I don't think will reverse. Um, because the trend was going in that direction and this this COVID and the fact that you were more susceptible to adverse consequences from COVID if you ha were in poor health, I think has been a real accelerator of the health trend. And then lots of other trends and it's, you know, the world is always changing and there's always um, an amazing idea right now. And it, it, as an entrepreneur, you always think, oh God, I wish I'd thought of that. And you never think that brilliant ideas exist now. You always think they've just happened. Mm. But we're living in an age of, you know, Web 3.0 and cryptocurrencies and pandemics. And it's just an amazing time to, to be an entrepreneur. And in terms of, do you think that companies that are starting, do the owners have to become the brand themselves? Um, is that advice you would give out to people starting businesses? Or do you think it's fine to let the product yeah. and the service lead? Um, I think that as it relates to personal branding, uh, as a entrepreneur or a CEO, you have no choice. You are, you are intrinsically connected to the company, whether you post online or you don't. And it, it's even worse if you don't, because we've, and we've seen this with Mark Zuckerberg, you kind of have the old approach, the conventional approach to being a CEO was to be a black box. And what that meant was that you let your PR department and your CMO and your marketing department tell the world who your company were. And then social media came along and all of your employees have iPhones now and they have these reviewing websites. And if anything goes wrong in your company, any of your employees can take a photo of it and tweet it or leak it somehow. So you have to be a glass box and you have to embrace the fact that the world has changed and everybody can see inside your company mm -hmm. and the value of your products and the integrity of your product is being also judged based on the, the integrity of your company culture and the way you treat your teams. And we're seeing this with Amazon now. You know, I saw something on Twitter about some screen box that Amazon have. I think it's the press have kind of exaggerated that, but that's the kind of thing we've heard about Amazon staff pissing in bottles because they don't get breaks. These are the kind of things that then reflect on the company and the CEO. So you have to be a trans transparent um, CEO. That means you have to have a personal brand. And if you don't, you end up like Mark Zuckerberg because Mark Zuckerberg for 10 years made the decision that he was gonna hide from the public. Um, so that meant that the media could write the narrative of Mark Zuckerberg on his behalf. And as a, you know, a young entrepreneur, as a human being, I had no reference point other than what the media said as to what Mark Zuckerberg's character was. Conversely, Elon Musk took the opposite approach. Mm. Elon Musk says, you're going to know everything about me. He sits there on Joe the Rogan's, good, the bad, the all of it. Mm. Well, Mark Zuckerberg's actually come out of his bunker now. He actually said as his New Year's resolution in 2019, his objective was to come out of, quote, come out of his bunker and be more public. But Elon Musk has taken that approach for forever. And warts and all, you get to see Elon crying on podcasts, smoking joints on Joe Rogan's podcast. You, get, you feel like you know him. So if the media say something about him, I have my own reference point, which is I follow him on Twitter and I've watched hours and hours of his interviews to debunk what someone might say about him. And that is a form of like self-defense in this glass box era. Who's your role models? Um, I, th I think I have a lot of role models um, um, and they're all quite diverse. Everybody from like Ruth Bader Ginsburg to um, Martin Luther King to, and I also have role models for different reasons. I think it's quite, it's hard to look back at history and have historical role models that were perfect, right? Because the world has changed. Look at the royal the, family. But the word perfect hasn't changed. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I like certain people for certain things. Like I like Elon Musk for his ambition and the scale of his ambition. And his, he's totally, he seems to be totally putting him, himself after his mission. I like Kanye West because he has continually reinvented himself and resisted any label you give him. So if you said to Kanye West, you're a producer, he'd go, no, no, I'm a rapper. And they go, well, fine, you could be a rapper. And he goes, no, 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 I'm a, 
I, you know, I'm a fashion designer. You know, soon to be president. Or yeah, so, no, no, I'm a, I'm a be president. And I really respect that because a lot of people, they give themselves a label and they spend their entire lives living out this really binary label that society or that they themselves gave them. And it's not a good way to live your life. You end up midlife crises, unfulfilled dreams, wondering, you know, and life is meant to be, I feel like a journey of like, you know, excitement and spontaneity and experimentation and all of the color and variety of life and wherever it might take you. So like pigeoning, pigeonholing yourself, I feel like is a long-term mistake. So that's why I respect him. And then, you know, I love uh, both, uh, both Michelle and Barack Obama immensely. I got to speak with um, Barack Obama in Brazil on stage. Did you um, get your selfie? I uh, don't want to talk about it. Um, <laughs> it was meant to be arranged, but for whatever reason, it didn't happen. But um, he's a really just a, a man that I feel is of high integrity and a family man, and I respect him for that. Um, yeah, I've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of idols all over the place. And my inspiration is so diverse. Like, it comes from everything. It comes from choir, watching a choir sing, from going to the theater, listening to a song, seeing how a table is designed. And I think you can steal from all of these things to create your own, you know, art and your own stuff, your own businesses. So people typically think when they ask, like, what's your inspiration? They expect you to say, like, another business or another entrepreneur, but it's not, it doesn't work like that. I think creativity is, is you pulling loads of little pieces from loads of different things and putting them together in a, in a new way. Mm. So, yeah. And my last question to you before I open up to um, everyone in the audience is sort of what do you want to be remembered for then? I'm not really bothered. I don't really care. So I'm, I don't know. It's not gonna, I'm not going to be here anyway. Um, but but I, I, so I don't care how people remember me. Mm. I think I would, it would give me a lot of joy while I'm alive if my existence made other people's existence less um, depressive and more fulfilled. I think that's important to me. And I hope my kids, are, I hope my, I'm sure when I meet my kids, whenever they're born, um, I, I'm sure I'm going to hope that their lives are amazing but in terms of like memory i don't understand this legacy thing mm. as in like i think it's quite an egotistical thing to care that people um think well of you when you're gone like uh, is that really that feels like ego to me it really does and i think our, our generation are sp specifically very very susceptible to this idea of um of of really caring about um admiration and so like it's crazy that when you ask a young person these days what they want to do they'll say things like change the world right what does that mean or they'll yeah, like changing the world is a byproduct of you pursuing something you really care about like so changing the world is the byproduct of coming up with a cure for cancer and nobody that, that i know that's changed the world set out to change the world that was never their central objective their objective was to make black people and white people equal or to make a a, a smart computer you could fit in your pocket they would say, I want to make a smart computer that you can fit in your pocket. They didn't say, I want to change the world. Mm -hmm. What you're actually telling me is you want to be admired, right? Um, but uh, admiration isn't, isn't the, the, the first goal. The, the first goal is pursuing a problem that you want to really solve and that you think will generate value, is value generative. And as a consequence of that, you get rich and famous. But you don't start by getting rich and famous. That's not what you aim for. So whenever someone says that to me, I go, a young person, so what do you want to do? I want to change the world. I think you've got no fucking chance. Do you know what I mean? You've yeah, got yeah. no chance. And I also get it when I speak on stage. If I do like a big show in like a big arena, so there's 9,000 people in the arena, someone will come up to me often and they say, oh, I want to be a public speaker. And I go, that's not where public speakers start. Like typically that's not where, what tends to happen is, and at least in my case and in all of the good speakers I know, is they went and pursued a problem and went and did something with their lives and it gave them something remarkable to talk about. Mm. So again, that's, that's the outcome me being on that stage in Barcelona was the outcome of me pursuing a, a challenge and a problem I really cared about. I didn't, at 18, I didn't write in my diary, be a public speaker, change the world, be famous. But you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Anyway. Thank you for that. Amazing. So we'll open it up to questions in the audience. Um, if you just keep your masks on and we'll wait for a mic to come across to you. So if we just start on this side. Hi, hello. Hey. It's lovely to meet you. I'm actually, can I take this off for a second? It's, yeah, I was actually walking in Cambridge like a few months ago listening to your podcast. Oh, I think it's the one with Grace Beverly. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a privilege to meet you. Um, just, I actually have a question concerning, you know, like staying true to yourself. And um, when you touched upon convention and maybe not playing to convention, 
Um, so they say there's a phrase that, that like five people who you spend most of your time around, you kind of like pick up your influence by or you learn, copy their kind of habits. With university, when you were there, how did you like, what was the main thing, like kind of that fire inside of you that told you, I'm just going to follow my own path and stay, stick to it? It's a very good question. Um, so what was, the, what was the, the fire inside me that gave me the like conviction to follow my own path? I don't know, for me, so people think it was, because I think the question kind of assumes that leaving university was a risk. Whereas I was under the opinion that staying in that university for three years, getting all of that debt, and then coming out the other end with this group of apparent alcoholics was a risk. And that would, that would be a real substantial risk to my chance of living the life I wanted to live. But I was clear on the life I wanted to live. And it was very apparent to me that this process wasn't the most effective way for me to get there. So that was the risk. Staying in university would have taken a lot of courage for me because it was clearly wrong. And for me, like, I don't know, I, uh, there's clearly something inside me which um, is somewhat delusional or is, it doesn't necessarily believe the, how, the persuasive nature of like convention or my parents' advice. Um, it's, you know, I can, take yourself, I can take myself right back to when I was 14 years old. But so the factors that kind of made me, I think the factors that made me the way I am is my, when I was very, very young, I was black. <laughs> Did, that didn't change. Um, and I lived in an all white area of like, and in our school we had about 15,000, 1500 kids. And I'm pretty sure they were all white. And I was very different. And uh, on top of that, if you look up my street, the street I grew up in, all the houses are like really pretty, right? Middle class area. And then there's ours, which is just like destroyed. Grass is six foot high. The back, got, the back of the house is knocked down. So if you open the, like one of the, the doors in the house, you just go out into the garden, like a normal like in, yeah, door that you'd find in your house, because they just knocked the back off half of a house, bricks everywhere. Like it looked like a bomb had dropped, and like two of the walls had fallen, but two of them had stayed up. Fridges, there's probably like ten fridges in our back garden and TVs. Just it was a we were living in a scrap heap, but we were living in the context of a very perfect neighbourhood. And I think the way that you attribute value to anything in life is within the context in which you see it. So if you, you know, I say in my book, if you get an, an, a Nokia, like an old Nokia brick phone, and you put it on the table in 1990, people would go, that's an amazing phone. But the minute you put three iPhones next to it, the Nokia looks like a piece of shit. And in living in that street, going to that school and being different made me feel like I, I think deep down, made me feel like I wasn't enough, or I wasn't good enough, or I, or I put a bit of a chip on my shoulder. Um, that coupled with the fact that my parents were never home, right? By the time I was 10, my mum would sleep on the floor in her shop because she was getting burgled all the time. So, because she was black. So she was getting burgled all the time. So she was like, I'm not going to leave the shop. So she, in the back room, put this big bag of rice down and would sleep in there. And I'd, I'd, she, I came in one day and she'd be like, this is the bag. It was chewed up because all the rats were eating it. She'd just sleep in there. So 10 years old, there's no parents in my house. There's no one giving me anything, but there's this huge desire to have things and what that does is you've got no choice to start doing experiments to see if you can get those things for yourself. You start selling things and doing things, and that's how confidence is built. It's building like small marginal amounts of evidence that you can do the thing you tried to do. And if everything as a child is done for you, you never have the chance to build that evidence. So by the age of 18, uh, probably a little bit earlier, me, but not my brothers, because when they grew up, they were parented. I'd built this huge amount of evidence that, you know, I could get things that I wanted to get. And that was probably as a result of having just so much independence. So at 18, I, I quit university fully believing that that wasn't going to make me broken and poor. I thought I was going to be able to figure it out. And I think that comes from, com comes from that evidence that I built my childhood. Does that make sense? Okay. And if we have a question over this side as well. Don't you dare take your mask off. <laughs> oh, he took it off when you turned your back. I can't hear you. Those entire day of vlogging, like 
you're commuting yeah. from Manchester to London for business meetings. I've seen all that. So really inspiring. And what I've seen is you've succeeded following the trends, whether that's building social media agency at the right time or focusing on your personal brand or uh, going on to podcast now, mm. uh, YouTube and all, all that thing. So my question is like, where do you see those next big trends in mm. businesses? Uh, I, I know you've got an investment company that you're trying to focus on investing in crypto mm -hmm. uh, space, biotech, and all, of, all other things. So where do you see the next big trend that entrepreneurs like us should focus? Are they just everywhere? They're just everywhere within every industry. There's sub-trends within health. There's trends within the university space now. You know, um, within if, if I was to pick one that I'd, I'd probably be working on and that I am working on. Can you tell me after? Instrument. Oh, you want to know just for yourself? <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. I'm I can't tell you. No. Um, no. Um, I think I think probably blockchain um, technology and and startups are most interesting to me at the moment because it feels like the dawn of uh, a new era in in and that's what they call like Web 3.0. It just feels like the early social media days, and it's got all the components of the early social media days, you know and uh, so I think that would be a really smart place to be learning and to be building something. And, and like when the good, the, this is like strange advice, but I failed in my first business. But if I hadn't failed, I wouldn't be here. And it's a super cliche, but th I would genuinely implore you to go and fail in that space. Go and build something, even though if it doesn't work, because even by being in that space, having any experience, holding yourself in there, learning, you know. It's just tremendously, tremendously valuable. And like, so it's, for me, it's not even about succeeding in that space. Like failing in that space would be tremendously valuable to you. You'd then go get hired somewhere else. You'd then meet a ton of people in that space and learn a ton of things. So I think it's really important to, to if, if we are, if we're doing, if we're just saying outside of your, you know, any passions you might have, if I was to put myself anywhere, it would definitely be just right in the heart of the, the blockchain space. And the thing is, when I say that, there'll be people thinking, but I don't know anything about it. And that is the barrier that holds everyone else out and rewards those that persist and the, those that go and, you know, um, over, can overcome that. Same with social media. When we started, it was like, you know, people didn't, weren't really sure about it. Tons of skepticism. Most people didn't know anything about it. Um, and we threw ourselves in it and held ourselves there. In my first startup, I basically failed in that space, which led me to Social Chain, where we succeeded. And it's important to say, so when I failed at Woolpark, the year between Woolpark and Social Chain, I was paid £70,000 a month by companies that were paying me to tell them about social media. And that's why I'm saying it's so valuable to fail in this space, because nobody else had the knowledge I had from failing. £70,000 a month I was getting paid from a Bebo in San Francisco, the billion, almost billion dollar company um, that uh, got acquired by seven, for £700 million by Fling, Explovia, all of these clients around the world. So I was 21 years old, flying around the world to Brazil, San Francisco, um, Thailand for months, Spain, all over, getting paid 70 grand a month to talk about this thing that nobody else knew about, social media. So I'd go fail there if I was you. Honestly, I yeah, if, if I was young as well and I didn't. The thing about me now, right, is I have tons of very valuable experience in a certain area, which I know I can leverage to make hundreds of millions. So it probably makes more sense for me to leverage that. Because I have experience and reputation, which makes it hard to get. So it probably makes sense for me to focus more there in terms of generating big value for myself. But if I didn't, and, I, and it was a, a case of where do I want to build my experience to have great future value, then I'd go be failing in blockchain right now, 100%. Are you going to primarily invest in with your, this private equity vehicle that you've set up? For sure. I'm, I'm in the top... 10,000 Ethereum holders in the world, <laughs> according to the internet, according to EtherScan. I have a lot of Ethereum, which can be stressful. <laughs> no, it's not. I don't care. I don't look at it. I actually have not looked at it for days. But no, I, yeah, so I invest directly in the cryptocurrencies. I invest in mining companies like Northern Data. They do um, high performance computing mining. And yeah, I'm involved. I've got my skin in the game. And I'm building a startup called Access Packs at the moment, which is super interesting team in San Francisco, it's a blockchain startup. It's like Pokemon cards, but for access to celebrities, you can either redeem the access or trade it. So if I, I could win, open up the pack and win dinner with Elon Musk, and then I can either redeem it 
and go for dinner with Elon Musk, or I can put it on the marketplace and trade it up. Every time it's traded up, Elon Musk makes money. So that's access packs, um, pretty self-explanatory. And it's a good thing I can explain it in a two sentences or three, because that means it's going to be easier to market. Um, yeah, and then my, 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 my main company, my main focus is my new company um, called Flight Story. And that's um, quite similar to what I did at Social Chain with a quite significant twist. Um, and I'm going to raise somewhere between 50 and 100 million and um, use that to fund the growth of the company. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm in the process. I'm just about to start raising the money. And if we take a question from this side. Masks are very important, but I hate masks. I really hate masks, but they are very important. Yeah. Um, I've probably got a bit of defending to do about the pitch outside. <laughs> um, but I guess you kind of mentioned about processes, right? Well, I think there is a process to a lot of these things. And even like you said about female entrepreneurship, um, but like, there's also kind of a game of touch points sometimes, um, where like, if Steve was to check his phone now, I'm pretty sure I might be the first message that's on there, and I'm pretty sure I, I messaged him a few years ago, met him a few years ago as well. Um, so the approach outside is more from a case of, you never know what comes to these things sometimes, um, and as I say, kind of the touch points is a big thing. Steve as a person um, was is definitely like a person that. I would rather be around to work on these things because of the morals and, and the values that he puts out. Um, but as, I guess it comes to the second part of the question, but I felt like I had to defend that first part. But, um, but yeah, so you, you, you speak a lot about mental models, Steve, like first principle thinking and stuff. Um, in a world, and I'm not sure, I think you might agree with me on this, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, or at least some that I've met in the little space that I've been, been in it, big thinkers, very deep thinkers, um, people like Dan at Heights, huge, very deep thinker about certain things. What is the difference when it comes to mental models? And I know in your book, you spoke about the time when uh, you lost 80% you of your business because of the, the hacking scandal. What is the difference between overthinking, um, deep thinking, and being able to act in a way that still stays rational? Um, where is that difference in, in terms of deep thinking and being able to act? Yeah, so I think, well, typically when I think of overthinking, I think you are playing out scenarios in your mind um, that you're playing out a series of not necessarily logical scenarios in your mind, um, which tends to lead to anxiety. And, um, and that, it, that isn't typically a helpful thing to do. I, and the, for me, deep, deep thinking is a very unemotional sort of logical reasoning process where I'm trying to understand the outcomes of various, um, various options that I have before me, but I'm doing it without worry and um, almost I'm holding the challenge out in front of me as opposed to it being within me. So when I think of overthinking, I think of like sitting in your room and catastrophizing about what the future holds. And when I think about like the, the depth of thinking that I describe in my book when we got hacked, it was, more, it was more a case of holding out what's happened in front of us and saying, this is the path forward. If we do this, it's not helpful. If we do this, it'll be helpful. Let's do this. Let's try this. Um, and it's a much more logical, less emotional approach to solving a problem. And it's hard to, I mean, it's just impossibly hard to give people that advice because that advice of not being emotional when all hell breaks loose is not stronger than your innate childhood conditioning and what's happened to you. And some people worry, some people catastrophize, some people panic when things go wrong. Um, and my advice is not gonna be stronger than, than that. Um, I, I actually think that about most of my advice. I think most of the advice I give people is useless because there's stronger forces at play. Um, but I give it anyway, because sometimes it helps. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it does. And also, to your point, um, your first point about approaching someone, you know, showing up and approaching them in a street or whatever, or whatever, I think it can be an effective strategy. I think that it's just, a, it's an, it's an art, there's an art to it. And um, I've seen it go badly. I've had people fly across the world and show up at our office in like a pink suit with a one-way ticket. And it's, you, you know, and be very just crazy. And then I've seen it go well, where someone is a bit more composed and they're more respectful and 
they are clear about what they want and it's not a lot it's just a chance to take things further or for you to look at something so it's there's a way to do it um and, yeah there's a way to approach someone you want to speak to and in fact that's been central to my success in my life because going back to when I was 16, but even my first investor, the one that I said when I was in a hotel in London with, and he said, I don't know what you do, but I'm investing in you. I went on LinkedIn and typed in the word investor. And he was the first person that came up. I was in Manchester. So the way the LinkedIn algorithm works is it shows you people that are also in Manchester. He wasn't in Manchester. He was in Monaco, but his LinkedIn still said he lived there because he used to live there. Just so happens that he made all of his money building a student website in Manchester. Like, what are the odds? But I was... While everyone else was asleep, I was on LinkedIn. So you can call it luck, but you were asleep when I was on LinkedIn. And I do believe in knocking on doors, but you have to know how to knock or else you're just wasting your time. And there's a really classy way to approach someone. And it's not begging, you're not a charity. You're not asking them for too much. You completely appreciate the world they live in, that they are busy and you're probably one of a thousand that have approached them. And if you can really, and this is also like a, a fundamental, really good marketing lesson. If you can really, really put yourself, which is impossibly hard to do, in the mind of the person you are trying to reach out to or the person you're trying to market to, you'll be great at it. Because, and this is like, and I'll tell you why it's impossibly hard. Because you will make something, you'll make a business, you'll make a product, whatever. And to you, after spending three years working on it, you'll just think it's the best thing ever. You'll think it's gonna change the world. It's the shiniest, fanciest thing ever and you'll be in that bubble, right? And so when you go to market it, for example, to the world, you won't realize that the person on the receiving end is going through a divorce, they are on their way to work, they've got a flat tire, it's raining outside, they're, they're, they've got depression and anxiety, and you've popped up going 10% off my shiny thing. They go, I don't give a fuck, I don't care. And if you understand, if you can really understand that nobody cares about you, Nobody cares. Nobody wanted to see your shiny thing today. Nobody believed that they needed one. And if you, can, if you can market from that perspective that nobody gives a fuck, then you'll create marketing which is compelling, not just 10% off your toothpaste. You know, and, and that's, I put myself there and that's, that, that helps me to create things that I think are more, more thumb stopping in the timeline. Um, anyway, that's a tangent. Really, really enjoyed hearing that. Got time for one more question if we just take it from this side. I said that to my team for years, for years at Social Chain. I said, nobody, just pretend for a second. I used to sit on stage and I used to love the reaction because people would get so mad. They do care about me and care about my fucking, like, no, nobody, like, like, but it's not to say that nobody cares about you, but just create from there. Don't create in your bubble of three years working on something. Create from the, create your marketing or your outreach to someone from the perspective that nobody cares about you. And, it's, uh, and you'll probably be successful. Hi, yeah. So my question is about um, the way you leaving university after the first week um, impacts the way you view un a university education now. So mm. obviously when you got the call up to come and speak at Cambridge, was it like, oh, yes, so what? Because, you know, mm. you've got to where you are without having mm. had that university education. Or is it... Um, yeah. So I... My, so when, um, when they said, oh, you know, when I got the email about speaking at Cambridge, obviously it's such a prestigious place and there's so many amazing people that have spoke here, but I was fully intent on delivering a speech called University is a Scam. Fully intent. Had dragons not happened, had I had more time, that's what I'd be saying today. Um, and, and, and I think... Wait, wait, we still got time for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, maybe I'll come back and do the University is a Scam speech. But I think, like, for the vast majority of people, university is a scam. And it, like, 100%. Because, you know, you're getting sold something for anywhere between 30 and 50,000 pounds under the premise that it will deliver um, a uh, foot up for you in your career um, across a variety of different industries. And you're then delivered uh, information through PowerPoints, whatever, that is largely redundant in most industries, especially mine. You can't learn, go to university to learn about social media. By the time you've printed the book or made the slideshow, the thing has changed. There's 10 updates in the App Store alone for the big four social networks every week. Um, and then you come out the end for the vast majority of people with no advantage whatsoever. You know, and then I, I've been through this a million times with people and I, I, every year I post on my LinkedIn, university is a scam for the vast majority of people. Not for you guys. You having that Cambridge stamp is really gonna help you guys, but you are the minority. And in fact, everyone else is sold the university dream. They're paying for it on the basis of what you guys get. 
right? So for the vast majority of people, university is an absolute scam. And those people that I went to university with came out on my mother's life. Hannah Huxley stops me three years after. She was one of the people that was in the business class. She goes, Steve, so how did you, you started a business, so like, how did you go about it? And she is looking for a job. She has no, M Mike Barlow, who was on that course with me, he comes out of university with this degree and he has to go and apply. And he's applying for call centers that will take him irrespective of the degree. They all, they, in my company, I 700 people, no idea who's got a degree, does not matter. What I care about is has anyone got any experience? And if you want to work at Social Chain and you've got a, a, you're a Cambridge graduate or you have six months experience working down the road at another agency, I'm taking this person with six months experience, obviously, obviously. And that's the case for most industries, not all, but most. So for the vast majority of people, university is a scam because you're promised something for your 50K that is not delivered for the vast majority of people. And then you carry that debt through life with you. You guys are fine. If you go to this university, you're fine. You're getting what is promised. You're getting a foot up. The Cambridge thing is cool. The Ox Oxford thing is cool. LSE, yeah, cool. But for the vast, that's not the vast majority. That's the minority. And so for the vast majority of people, it is a scam. And it's a scam propped up by places like this where you are delivered the promise. And that's why my mum didn't talk to me because she thought that when I left Manchester University, that meant I was going to be an abject failure for the rest of my life. So she said, I'm not speaking to you until you go back to that shitty university. And thank God I didn't, because I'd be 50K in debt and knocking on the door trying to get a call center job. That's what, it, that's what, it, that's what would have happened. And it's, the problem is university is held in place by a, a bunch of stakeholders. One of them is your parents, right? Because they are conditioned based on the past and based on you know, maybe how university was once, was once upon a time before the internet. Did from, your parents, from their parents go to university? My mum dropped out of school when she was five years old and she can't read or write still. So she, was, she grew up in Africa, she can't, still can't read. I, was, I tried to teach her to read a few times, but it's just, you know, I'm very busy. Um, uh, my dad did go to university, went to Coventry. Um, so you've got parents holding it in place. Then the school is incentivized by how many people they get into the university system. So they are also pushing people towards university because then they brag about it. They then say to new applicants, oh, we got 80% of our kids to get A to C and into universities. Um, so they have to, they're incentivized to brag about it. The university institution is obviously incentivized. And then the working world on the other end, when you come out of university, a lot of them will say things like, it's changing a little bit, but they'll say you, like a lot of jobs you can't apply for unless you have at least a 2-1 in something. Like when I, after I'd finished Woolpark and I'd, I was midway through social chain, I remember we got a, something from um, one of the big supermarkets and they wanted us to post something um, looking for managers, um, and the, the criteria to apply was you had to have a 2-1 in, uh, in, in anything to apply. And I'm looking at this, this, this ad on my website thinking, I can't even apply for it. And I've got 700 employees ar around the world, and I'm the CEO of this massive company doing hundreds of millions of revenue, and I can't apply to be a manager at Sainsbury's because the system is that like, outdated and irrelevant. So it's held in place. And, and, it's, and, and it is a scam, like, and especially in, in 2021, where you've got the world's information accessible in the palm of your hands, as if you need to spend 50 grand to go to Manchester Metropolitan University and have some guy read slides out to you, as if nobody thinks that's smart. We have YouTube, we have the internet, we have all of the world's information in the palm of our hands. Obviously, that's a scam, obviously. And if an alien came down to earth and they saw all of the available options to pr propel, your, propel yourself in your career, and there's this one over here, it's like, give us like 10K a year. Dave's gonna show up, sometimes he'll be late and he's gonna run you through some slides and then we'll give you a piece of paper to say, you did the slideshow. You'd be like, what, versus sitting on my laptop or, or going and getting a paid internship in a company where, where I get experience? Obviously that's a scam. You'd report it to the police. And eventually we'll all realize that. Places like this though, not a scam. But you, hard to get into. Do you think... I could never have got in here. And I've done fine. But they would never have had me. What do you think the outlook of education looks like then? So if we were to sort of... Yeah, I mean, it's like, oh my God, it's like... The Google. COVID did the... not help. Because all this, you, you know, it forced a lot of people to have to work from home. But yeah, I mean, 
P places like Cambridge and Oxford, uh, Oxford will do fine, but um, I, I think the wider university system is gonna is is in is in de is serious decay, and is in serious crisis. And I, I don't think it's going to be long before the university institution as we know it is going to fall apart because it just makes no sense. And people, you know, one of the, the most compelling. It's like you're spending fifty grand for like adult dating. That's like really it. That's like really it for for the vast majority of people. That's really what you're getting. Like, oh, mm, they help me grow up. And some don't have to don't pay even fifty grand to grow up. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I leave, moved that at home. You could have moved that at home. Do you know what I mean? You didn't need to waste four years of your life and spend fifty grand to move out of home. There's there's other ways, but we rarely present those other ways because people aren't incentivized to do so. So that's why I'm so passionate about. It. That's also why I say it how it is because I think that just even one person hearing it, you know, would might give them the conviction they need to to go another route. Definitely. Um, we look forward to that whole one hour on just what Stephen Bartlett thinks about education. We need to have that next time here. Yeah. So you always end your podcast with your dating. What's going on in Stephen oh, Bartlett's dating life? It's been a while. Um, How do you not know yeah, that? <laughs> God, what's going on in my dating life? Fucking hell, what a question. Mm. I... Um, what's going on in my dating life? <laughs> it's very complicated. Okay. It's very. It's always been very complicated. If I look back the last couple of years, it's always been very complicated. One of the reasons is because um, I'm I'm very obsessive about my work, so I give a lot to my work. So it's very hard to find someone who really understands that. Um, but I, I blame myself for that. I think I I don't compromise enough, and I'm very selfish um, as it relates to my time. Right now, I'm single, um, and I'm just being patient. I meet a lot of people. I have a lot of inbound inquiries um but i i don't date i don't tinder bumble nothing i don't do any of it i don't creep in dms and message people i just wait and i do you know what the this is a good adv piece of advice when i was 18 no one wanted to date me no one wanted to date me no one was interested in dating me but i spent all my time focused on myself making myself a more compelling proposition more valuable knowing more stuff about the world you know now working out and taking care of myself and it proved to be you know in life you have a choice and in business you have a choice you're either a salesman or you're a magnet and that made me a magnet so working on myself and focusing on myself makes me a magnet which is a much nicer way to live same with our business we never had in social chain any outbound salesperson ever we we focused on being a magnet so we were built the ceo's personal brand we we told stories to the world on LinkedIn. It's kind of like a peacock. And the world came to us. And all of our competitors would have 20, 30 people on the phones like this. We never had one person. And it's the same within my life. I focus, I focus on myself, making myself a better person, make my emotional re reactions better, being more self-aware. And that means that although I've got more options than I've ever had before, um, I, I also have a lot of patience. And I don't really, you know, it'll figure itself out. So... Good luck with that. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Stephen Bartlett. It's been amazing to chat to you about what you've been up to and the journey you're on. We look forward to watching you on Dragon's Den. Thank you, everyone that also joined us here today. And we look forward to seeing you over the coming week. We've got some really exciting people coming in, um, everyone from Jeremy Corbyn. Um, have a great evening. <laughs>